stand. It's time to begin tonight. I'm just going to open up this service in prayer, ask the Spirit of the Lord to come and have His way in this place. Lord, we thank You again for the opportunity to gather in the sanctuary. We ask You that You'd pour out Your Spirit in a mighty way. Everything that's done, every song that's sung, every testimony given, Lord, as we break forth the Word of God, I pray that the anointing of God's sweet Holy Ghost would come in this house. And Lord, we thank You in Jesus' mighty name.
house of the Lord tonight. You don't mind giving him a hand cup of praise tonight. He's been good to his church. He's always been there. Every time I've battled, through every struggle, he's always been there. It's Resurrection Sunday. We have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, I just want to say I'm thankful for the men's retreat. It was very effective. Um, and you might say, like, how, how was a men's retreat effective? Right before we were getting ready to leave, we were standing there in a circle, all of us guys. Brother Nathan goes, I feel like a man. And everybody else goes. So I think, uh, I think that's one good way of knowing if the men's retreat was effective. The ushers would please, please come. The ushers. Uh, please, please be in prayer for Harvest Time, School of Ministry. Uh, we're about to go on tour. Be in prayer for Harvest Time Church that will be leaving in the morning, heading to Honduras. Like fervent prayer. There's, there's souls on the line every time we go. So please be in prayer. Ladies retreat, Saturday, April 27th. Be ready. Kingdom's Kids, age 5 through 12, will be taking a day trip on Friday, April 5th to Discovery Science Place. The cost is $8, and they will need to bring a sack lunch. For more information and to register, please see Gus or Sister Cameron. Please get in with us tonight, brother, if you don't mind saying the prayer over the offering.
Jesus is the reason why you sing. Can somebody just give him a hand clap if that's the reason why you sing? Let him know he's worthy. You know, I kind of came to the pulpit tonight debating exactly because I'm kind of like torn between two things to talk about. I will not run them together, but uh, I was thinking and I have been, it's been on my mind lately about the state of individuals in the church. And I'm gonna share with you a story that happened to us uh, in New York, and I'll try to be brief. Um, but when we was in New York, uh, Pastor Matt and Sister Tori and Justin and Rebecca, they took us to New York early part of December, our second years. And uh, it's pretty incredible. I've been to a lot of, a lot of, I've been to Miami, Chicago, LA, but New York's like completely different. It's the first time I was there. And we was on the last day and Pastor Matt, as he always is doing, is cultivating us to be great leaders and to have a spirit of excellence and to lead by example. And so he had put charge uh, that some of us would lead throughout the day. And we had a long day on our final day and I was leading the group. And this, this story just hits me in such a way, but uh, I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person that if my phone is on 99 or 98 percent I'm like get to the charger I, I know it sounds crazy but something about it not being 100 percent because when I grew up in church they told me 99 and a half won't do okay so I just apply that to my phone battery as well but after a long day of having my google maps and trying to catch this subway in after a long day of taking a lot of pictures because I'm from Oklahoma and New York is kind of like another world and a lot of selfies and all this stuff after a long day of that, my phone battery was on 1%. And I had never had my phone battery on 1%. Like I said, 98%, I'm rushing to the charger. But, you know, we get on a subway, and if you've ever been on a New York subway, and I found this out the hard way, but with the constant shaking back and forth so gently and the soft rumble of the wheels, it can quickly put you to sleep. And uh, I'm supposed to be leading this group, I'm in the front part of the subway. We have boarded a subway and the rest of the group is toward the back. And some leader I am, I'm over there. I mean, I am sawing locks. And I want you to understand something about this story. The call comes over the radio that the, cha that the subway is going express. If you know what that means, it's coming from one street and it's gonna miss multiple stops that it would normally stop at, but it's gonna rush from this street to that street. And I'm asleep, and the rest of my group hears the call, and I don't. And they get off the subway. And I stirred ever so slightly, and I thought, man, we still got four stops to go, I'm good, and I take a quick glance, and my group was not there. And I jump up fast, I turn, I look out the window, and Sister Hannah's standing there, and she looks up, makes eye contact with me, and she looks so frightened. Have you ever looked at somebody's face and could read like five sentences from a facial expression? I don't know what all she was thinking, but I was scared too. I was like, man, I'm on 1%. Well, how does this story end? Me homeless, part of a New York gang? This doesn't look good. But I want you to, I, I want you to realize something about this story. And obviously I'm here. Some of those things that happened, thank God, uh, for Brother Justin. Shout out Brother Justin. He came and found me where I was. But I want you to notice something about this story. I fell asleep and got comfortable in a season that was meant to be temporary. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me the other day and said, Lane, there's too many people because they don't know their season. They think that anything that comes along is a blessing. And I thought that sleep was a blessing. I was over there sleeping. But watch this. If we're not careful as individuals and as a church, We'll stay in temporary seasons longer than we meant to and longer than God wanted us to do, uh, wanted us to, st to stay there. And the destination that night was the Airbnb. And what the crazy, the crazy thing was, was that the subway didn't lead to the front door of my destination. It was just a temporary season to get there. We got back to the Airbnb that night and they laughed at me and I would have laughed at me too. So that's totally fine. I would have picked on somebody else if it, was, if it was somebody else, but... I want you to understand there's a lot of people that are living in relationships, financial situations, maybe calls that God's put on your life that it was meant to be temporary for a season, but because we got comfortable and complacent there and we got apathetic toward the things of God, we have fallen asleep. 
And I've been looking at situations in my life lately, and I'm just going to be very vulnerable with you. I'm identifying a couple places where I've let my guard down, and I've got to sleep in a place where the devil is rocking me to sleep. And I've come to tell somebody that's there tonight, it's time to wake up, shake yourself, and say, I'm waking up because the time is short. Jesus is coming back and he is not coming back for a church full of apathy, full of complacency, full of religion, full of legalism, full of worldliness, but he's coming back for a church that is ready and waiting for her king. So tonight I just want to reiterate this. If that is you in a season that's meant to be temporary and you've fallen asleep, wake yourself before it's too late. But I'm looking in the eyes of many elders across this building there. Perhaps there's a situation where God has put a calling on your life early in your life. And you miss, you feel like your prime time. And I want to tell you it's never too late to be who God called you to be. It's never too late to be what you might have been. I looked up to realize that door was closed and I couldn't go force it open. But Brother Justin came down to my street where I was in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Queens. And I want to tell you, I don't care how lost you are or how far you've went or how many times you messed up. I serve a God that will go to the furthest link to come get you. He's still reaching in a mess and making a message out of a mess. And I'm so thankful that he reached in the gutter. He removed all the clutter and he loved me like no other. And there was nothing else that I could do to get me out of my mess. But he still made a message out of the mess. So tonight as I turn it over to the next person, I just want to ask you tonight, have you fallen asleep where you're at? in a temporary situation, God bless you. We're in the house of the Lord tonight. I couldn't help but get emotional as Sister Faith was singing about the blood and really just this whole weekend as I went over the account of the crucifixion. I've just been so overwhelmed by Christ's love for us. Isaiah 55 and three reads, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. I wish I had enough time tonight to remind you of all that the the Lord's um, death and resurrection brought for us and what it did for us. But instead, I'll try and sum it up with these words. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to comprehend such a love, but I know this, I'm thankful for the price that was paid on Calvary. I'm thankful for the blood that was shed on that cross for me and for my sins. I'm so thankful that his blood covers a multitude of sins. Just enter on on in and worship with us tonight. Um, Earlier, I was in the dorm, just praying about the service in general because you know it's Easter and my own life I find it many times where I focus on the death of Christ because you know he died for my sins and you know, I've been a horrible person I have a lot of sins it's a big thing I'm thankful for it so I took some time today to just meditate on his resurrection and in doing that I uh I was reminded of C.S. Lewis book uh book series of books you know they're for little kids but it's it's you know the, the Chronicles of Narnia and C.S. Lewis is known for putting a lot of juicy biblical stuff in there. And I, I, was, I was thinking, I was praying, and I started, there's a, there's a type of Jesus, there's this lion. And, you know, he's supposed to represent Jesus. And he, he's helping these, these, these four children, you know, conquer the enemy, defeat evil. But in doing so, this lion dies. And these two little girls see the lion die. And they're sad. But you know what happened to that lion? Three days later, he was resurrected. And something that was so powerful in the story, and if, you, if you're a Christian and you're reading that, you're like, yes, it's awesome. But then if you continue the series, the little girl that was there, her name was Susan. She was really little when this happened. She had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. She had seen him die and resurrect. She had been in church all her life. She had grown up right here where you're at today. But you know what happened to Susan when she got older? She started to call it a fairy tale. 
She started saying it was fake. She tried to ignore what happened to her, what she saw. Today, I wanna tell you, I know it's Easter, we might have some visitors. If you're that person who is ignored, who has said it was a fairy tale, today, my God is calling you. He wants you back. It's not a fairy tale. My God is real. He died, he rose again that you may have new life. Church, I don't know who you are, but today he is here for you. He wants you. Today, you might be Susan on the verge of leaving, on the verge of giving it all away for material things, of saying it is just a fairy tale. Remember, remember what you saw. Remember the truth you saw, the miracles that took place. Because you're in harvest time. It is real. This church, remember it is real.
I'm so glad that my past has been erased. I'm so glad that my God gave me a new heart and a new name. And this song makes me think of one of my favorite scriptures. It's Isaiah 43. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I love this verse because it's a promise from God. He will do a new thing. It shall spring forth and we will know it. And I can testify of this truth in my life because my life was a life of past, sorry, my past was a life of death and despair. I had nothing there to sustain me or to give me life, but God showed up and he did a new thing inside of me. He put a new thing in my heart. He did a new thing in my mind. And if he did it for me, why shouldn't he be able to do it for you? Acts 2 and 39 says, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you have been born again and if you have Jesus in your heart, then your past is erased. Stop holding on to it. If you keep looking behind you, you'll never see what God is doing right in front of you. Because Jesus didn't call you out of your grave so that you could live in the cemetery. He wants you to make beauty from your ashes. But you will never see the beauty if you keep staring at the ashes. When you hold on to your past, the devil is able to use it against you. He'll tell you that you're not really saved. He'll lie to you and tell you everything you're not. But when he does, remind yourself of who Jesus says you are. Because the devil is nothing but a liar. He loves to tell you how broken you are. But Jesus tells me that there's a cross that made me whole. The devil would have you believe that you're still dirty. But the blood of Jesus washed you clean. Satan loves to make you think that there's no hope. But there's a mansion with my name on it in heaven that tells me otherwise. The devil would love to tell you that you're worthless. But there's a Jesus that thought that I was worth dying for. So set your eyes on Jesus. Don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right, and don't turn back around. Walk in confidence knowing that his blood is enough. His resurrection is enough. His word is enough, and it will always come to pass. That was a great word. So uh, Sister Kendra actually shared the verse that I was going to share, but I'll share it anyway. It's one of my favorites, especially this time of year. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, five through six. God never gave up on me, even when he had every reason to. He never stopped pursuing me. And I wouldn't care if it wasn't for him. I can never begin to thank him enough for the sacrifice that he made so that we could live. So as the next speaker comes, remember, Jesus loves you, and he loved you enough to give his life. And all that he wants is for you to give your life to him. I'm so thankful on this Resurrection Sunday that he's not just a story, he's not just somebody I sing about, but he's somebody that I know, and he's the reason why I sing. And I was praying about what to testify about and had 25 different things going through my mind, but I was going to testify about last Wednesday. Um, a lot of y'all know that we had a really amazing chapel service, and I got to touch myself. But as soon as chapel was over, the enemy started attacking my mind and absolutely tormenting me. And all the questions of why, why has this happened, I don't understand. So many different questions at one time, and so much fear and so much anxiety. And we got into choir practice, and it just, it all hit me. And I was standing there trying my best to keep it together and be the person that I am and hide everything that goes on with me. And I broke. And in the middle of choir practice, we stopped. Stopped everything for that to meet and pray. And there's times when you go through things and you don't understand why things are happening and why you feel the way that you feel. But we serve a God who will stop everything to meet you where you are. He didn't go to the cross. He didn't suffer and bleed and die for us to live a life bound, sick, sad, depressed. But he went for us to be free. And he's the God that walks on the water. That's what he's known for. He'll walk on your storm and he will come to where you are and stop everything around you just to meet you there, just to be with you and to help you and I'm so thankful that we serve a God who loves us so much that not only did he die for us but that he'll go in the middle of our storm and he will meet us exactly where we are so worship with us as we sing
Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. There were some uh, really powerful testimonies uh, touching, touching me myself. And I noticed there's one common thread between all of our testimonies, and it's that Jesus is risen. <laughs> Amen. Jesus is risen. Pastor Matt preached a powerful message this morning about how life is a vapor. And you know, that ties into how Jesus is risen because life really is a vapor. And, what, and if Jesus never rose from that grave, church, if Jesus never walked out of that grave, if he never rolled that tombstone away, then you and I would not have a chance to live because he died so that we can live. And he gave his life so that we can have life. And this life is not gonna last forever. Like Pastor Matt said, he, he preached it so beautifully this morning, amen. And Pastor, I just wanna appreciate you uh, tonight and uh, thank you for this opportunity and everything you've done poured into my life. You've really done a lot in my life, Pastor Matt, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And so tonight I have a word on my heart. I believe the Lord has put something upon my heart. If we could just turn in our Bibles tonight. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 2. And we're going to read down just a it says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And tonight, if you could just bow your heads this morning, uh, tonight as I pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, again, to be behind your pulpit, God, and to preach to your people, your sheep, and your congregation, God. Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing in this life, in this church, and in this ministry, God. Lord, I know you're working and you know you're moving even behind the scenes, behind the curtains, God. You're doing things that none of us don't even realize. Some of us don't even see, God, but you're doing powerful things. And we would like to give you praise for it. We worship you and we exalt your name and we thank you for all that you're going to do in this house, Lord God. I pray that you would put the anointing on my lips and give me the unction to preach tonight the way I feel this, Lord God. We thank you and we love you, in Jesus' name. And so as, as we all know, we live in perilous times, amen? I know we can all agree on that, it's scripture. But we all can agree that we live in some very wicked times, right? We live in a time where man is very independent, right? Man is very self-centered, everything is about me. Me, 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 I want this, I want this when I want it. I want this before the next person. I want the best shoes before him. I want the, the best clothes or for the, the ladies, I don't know, the best new dress. And it's always all about me, all about us, right? And I know I'm not, it's not just me that believes that way. I know a lot of us believe and know that's how it is nowadays. Is that a lot of the times, everything seems to be so centered around us. And God began to deal with me about this. And let me just tell you this, church, I have a, a short time before Brother Layton comes and preaches the rest of the service to share my heart with you. Let me just tell you that the Lord has torn me up with this. The Lord has really torn me up with this, and I don't, I don't say that lightly, at least I try not to. But we all know that man's mindset is all about us. Like everything revolves around you. It's every man for himself. And a lot of the times we forget about the man next to us. And we forget about our brothers. And I notice this even being saved, that a lot of the times we come to God in prayer and it's all about us. We come to God and we're like, Lord, can you help me? Lord, I, I have this problem. Or Lord, I'm going through depression. Or Lord, I'm going through anxiety. Or God, can you help me to live this life? Or God, I'm not, it's not going so well at my job. Or Lord, why do I feel like this? Or God, why do I feel like they're better than me? Or I'm not getting used as much as they are. And it's always about us. And I was there one morning in, in the corporate prayer uh, for harvest time. And I was praying, and I don't believe I was praying selfishly. I was, I was genuinely lifting my burdens to God. Because a week before that, I was feeling burdensome. I came across a scripture. We all know it. 
for all of you who are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest, right? And so I'm lifting my burdens to heaven and I'm, and I'm giving him my petitions and my requests. And God puts this thing on my heart. And I'm like, Lord, you hear my heart. This is your scripture. Why don't you answer my prayer now? Because I've been seeking you for this. Where's your answer, God? Where's your hand? And I said, God, I have so much burden. And I felt the spirit speak to me. He says, but what about them? And what he was talking about was the rest of the young men in the school of ministry and the, and the rest of the young women. He said, but what about them? He says, what about their burden, Donnie? He says, everything you're facing, you don't think they face the same things? He says, all the weight that you have on your shoulders, can you imagine the weight on their shoulders? He says, Donnie, did I not save you for more than this? He said, I didn't bring you out of that grave just to complain about yourself. He says, I brought you out of darkness into this light to see a new way. He says, I brought you out of that grave where it was all about you, Donnie, so that you can see people. And we like to say, well, Jesus prayed and Jesus lifted his burdens. But how many of you know one of his last prayers on the cross while he's being betrayed by his own people was, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And can we just be honest for a second? They didn't know completely what they were doing, but at the same time, they were guilty men crucifying a, a sinless man. They knew that. But Jesus looks to the Father and he says, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus himself was selfless. He had all these burdens. He was about to go to the cross, church. You and I do not know what that feels like. We don't know what it's like to have all 12 of our disciples turn away from us at the time we needed it the most. And one of them even betrays us away with a kiss. We don't know what that feels like, church. But Jesus was selfless. And you see him upon that cross. And he's not complaining. He's not saying, God, get me off of this cross. He's not saying, God, take me off of this cross because I know you can do it. He says, God, can you just forgive them? For they know not what they do. And I'm sitting here in my prayer, in, in the prayer time, and I'm, and I'm lifting my burdens to God, and I'm saying, God, I'm so burdensome. Why can't you just take this burden away from me? And he says, Donnie, look at them. That's the way I heard it. And I begin to look at Man Jones, and I begin to look at Hunter, and I begin to look at Lane, and I begin to look at Joseph, and I begin to look at Jesse, and Haley, and Jalen, and my sister Audrey, and I begin to feel their burden. And I begin to say, God, how, how have I been so selfish? How can I look at myself when my brothers and my sisters have a thing to face? They have the same devil in their face, but I'm complaining about the devil in my face. Don, uh, God says, why don't you pray for them? And, I, and, and I'm walking down the aisle and I begin to lift all their names to, to heaven and I begin to pray and I begin to pray and I begin to pray and I notice something. My burdens begin to grow strangely dim. And let me, let me say something, church. They did not disappear. By no means, I still had the same burdens. But when it was less about me and more about my brothers and more about my sisters that God put in my life, I began to realize my problems and my burdens and my anxieties and my stress began to grow strangely dim. And it wasn't that God took away all my problems right then and there. But it was the fact that I was so focused on them, I couldn't see myself no more. And some of us, I, I felt the Lord speak this to me. Some of us are crying out to God, saying, God, I feel burdensome. God, take away this burden. But I could feel the spirit of the Lord saying, look at your brother. Look at your sister. What are they going through? What have they lost? What are they struggling with? What kind of weight are they carrying? Right? And the Lord was dealing with me. And you know, you know God is speaking to uh, you when, it, when, it, when it's about dealing with you, right? Because I know a lot of the times we like to doubt, is this good or God, or is this God, or is this me? But let me tell you, if you're getting dealt with, it's probably God. Because the devil is not going to deal with you on measures like that. He's not going to say, go pray for your brother. He's going to say, it's all about you. He's going to say, God's not answering your prayers, and you've been praying this for weeks. And so I knew it was God because he was dealing with me and my selfishness. And there's one thing I noticed, church, is that a lot of the times we approach a prayer room. A lot of the times we approach God, it's all about us. Me, me, me. 
I heard this thing one time. They said, the Holy Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? But the wicked Trinity is me, myself, and I. Because how many of you know Jesus is risen, right? But he did not walk out of a grave so that we can keep on living selfishly. He did not walk out of a grave to resurrect a worldly man. He did not walk out of the grave to, 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 for, for our, our worldly person, our, our carnal nature to keep on living. He died a thief's death, innocent man, and he rose so that we can live new. So that the old man could be done away with. Brother, that old man has gone away. He's done with. You might as well call him a dead man because the old Donnie is no longer living. Because when Jesus walked out of that grave, I walked with him. And I became a new man. And let me tell you something, church. When I got saved, yes, the, 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 the sky was a brighter blue. The, the grass was greener. But let me tell you something. After God dealt with me and after God broke my chains and after God freed me from my lust, the first thing I seen was people. I walked down the street, I remember so clearly, I couldn't look at the homeless man the same. I remember walking in school, I couldn't look at my teacher the same. I couldn't look at my friends the same. And I couldn't help but to think, God, that's a soul. And they're on their way to hell. I noticed this, church, that when God saved you, and this is not just Donnie's story, this is yours, Harvest Time Church. When God saved you, he did not just save you to look at yourself. When God saved you, he opened your eyes to people and you begin to see people. I did not sacrifice nine months to two years of my life to come to the school and ministry to get myself better. That's a part of it. But I came to this school to be equipped by men of God, fully, full by the spirit so that I can go help people. And many times everything is revolved around us. And I noticed this and I said, God, what are we gonna do about this problem? He says. It's time to start looking at them, Donnie. It's time to start looking at their problems. Because when you're so full of God, there is no room to be full of yourself. But when you're so full of yourself, there's no room for God. Because like I mentioned, this, this man has to die, church. The carnal man has to be put in a grave. And there's no reason to go knocking on that grave. He's a dead man. Do you remember that pain you felt? That shame, that guilt, you would fight for peace. You would fight for joy. That man is dead and gone. Your chains are broken, church. You are set free by the power of the cross. God's got you covered. So look at other people. You don't think that God has you covered. And this is how God was dealing with me. And I'm about to close right here. God was speaking to me. He says, you don't think I got you, Donnie? He says, you don't think I'm going to uphold you and listen to your prayers and petitions. He says, you better believe that I have you. But I didn't call you just to get yourself right. I already broke your chains. And I couldn't help when God saved me to see my family in chains. I couldn't help but to picture my baby cousin in chains and the devil laughing at it saying, I got them. I couldn't help but to look at my mom and my dad. I couldn't help but to look at my lost family members in chains and see myself. Because when you start seeing that picture, it's no longer about you, church. And your problems begin to grow strangely dim. Strangely dim. Amen. And if Brother Layton can prepare to come up, I just want to leave us with this thought. I said this already. But if you're so full of God, church, there is no room to be full of yourself. And some of us are lifting our burdens to heaven. We feel burdensome. But I want to tell you this, which is a very uncommon thing, that if you go ahead and start looking at your brother, and you go ahead and start looking at your sister, and you start thinking of your family bound in chains, and you start thinking of that drug addict on the street, and you start thinking of those teachers who are unsaved and lost, dying and going to hell. It is going to be so focused upon them that your problems and your struggles and your anxieties and your stress is going to become strangely dim because it's not all about us and it's not all about you. Amen. If I could just leave you with that, Brother Layton, if you can come preach the word. Amen. I'm so glad to know that today it's not all about me. I'm glad to know that 
Christ knew that it wasn't all about just him, but he was worried about you and I. And I pray that I can take on the same burden that Brother Donnie has, and I care about you more than I care about myself, more than I care about where I'm going. I want to care about where you're going today because that's what Christ done for me. He first cared about me, so now I can care about you. Thank you, Brother Donnie, for that word, for obeying God today. Again, thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. And again, we thank you for your ministry and your influence in our lives. Today, I believe God has got a word for each and every one of us. I know that there has already been a theme in the house in every testimony and every word that has been brought. And I believe that God is wanting to say something to you and I. Who knows that you didn't just walk into a resurrection service today. You didn't just walk into another Sunday evening service. But you walked into a divine opportunity for God to do something in your life. You may have thought it was just another day to come to church and leave the same way, but I want to remind you that God does not have just random opportunities and random moments, but God has divine moments like tonight. So I pray that you would come into this message with a mindset that tonight God has something in store for you and he has something in store for me, that it's not just an ordinary time in the Lord. So again, I I want to preach what God has laid on my heart for just a few moments. If you could, turn to Leviticus chapter 17. Verse 11, and I'll also be reading a familiar verse that's already been spoken twice by Sister uh, Kendra and Sister Michaela. It's Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6. I was praying before this service that God will confirm the word, because I'll be honest, church, I was struggling. I was struggling to know if this is what God had in store for us, and I believe that the Lord has truly confirmed it. So again, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I'll read that again. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, speaking of Christ, and acquainted with grief. And he hid as if were as it were our faces from him. And he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carrying our sorrows. Yet we did, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes... We are healed. All we we all like sheep have gone astray. We have every turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath not lain on him the iniquity of us all. For a few moments this evening, I want to preach on the simple thought: the life is in. The blood. This morning our pastor preached a wonderful message on life is but a vapor. We see that this temporal life, this flesh that you and I have to dwell in, it is nothing more than a, a vapor that, that is got here one moment and gone the next. But for a moment I want to preach on the life that is not of the flesh but rather of God. The, the life that will carry on from, from now until eternity. The life that we will live and the death that we may face in our soul. So if I could, Tyler, the life is in the blood. We see here in the Old Testament that God's way of wiping away and forgetting the iniquity of man was for a priest to shed blood of an innocent animal, an innocent spotless animal on the altar before God and as an expression for repentance. And God would see the sacrifice and would remember no more their transgressions. But what I love about this and what it tells me is that the entire ceremony of the atonement was revolved around the blood we see it was not just revolved around the altar but if it were not for the blood of that sacrifice there would have been no atonement had it not been for the blood there would have been nothing done for the children of Israel for their sin and today what I love about the covenant that God has made for us is that it is all revolved around the blood the life that Christ has for you it is not revolved around money or natural resources but the life that God has called for you is revolved around the blood you may can try to get out of it without having something gory as as the blood applied to your life. But I want to let you know for a reality check that if it's not for the blood, we are not saved. If it's not for the blood, you are still bound. If it's not for the cross of Calvary, you will not be here today. It's all revolved around the blood. The first thing I want to mention in this text is it's the blood. It's not just a one-time deal for you and I. 
You may be saved in this house tonight. You may be bought by the blood, and you may have had a one-time experience, but the blood for you and I is not just a one-time moment at an altar. The blood is not just a one-time experience where it is sprinkled on you and you are saved from your sins, but the blood is my power. The blood is my strength. The blood is my refuge. The blood is going to be my healing tomorrow as it is today. So I want to encourage you that the blood is not just for that one moment. It wasn't for just that one moment when God convicted you and you got saved. But it is just as much for today as it was them. We can all be here listening today of moments of people where they have pleaded the blood. Where they have called on the blood. Where they have called God. Send the power of the blood to, to keep, to save, to preserve, to make whole. We could go down the list of opportunities. The, the testimonies where God has intervened on the plea. God send the blood. We see here in in Revelation 12 and 11, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I want to know that I have got to have the blood as much today as the day that I got saved. I've got to have the blood applied to my soul as much today as the day that I, I got right with God at an altar in Richardson, Mississippi. I want you to know that you need the blood before you go home as much as you did the time you walked in the doors. You need the blood. If it's not for the blood, we are nothing. I need the blood. You need the blood. We need the blood today. And I'm thankful to know that the blood still lives. The blood has not dried up and gone cold, but the blood is flowing as liquid glory from Calvary to this day. So before you say that's an Old Testament thing, that's for a one-time experience, I want you to know that the blood still flows. It is said in medical science that without the blood in a body, that it cannot function. Without blood in the functioning organs of that body would be deprived of oxygen. And then it, it not only would do that, but it would soon grow cold. Not only could it not function, but it would begin to grow cold. Today, I cannot stand as a Christian without the blood. I cannot operate and function as a child of God without the blood applied and running through my soul. I want you to know that we are desperate for the blood. If you do not have the blood, you will soon grow cold. If you do not frequent that cross of Calvary, your, soon will, your life will soon grow cold towards God. We need the blood. First thing I want to establish is that what life is not in. I spoke of the, the, the title of the message that the life is in the blood, but before we can go on to that, I want you to know what the life is not in. What, what you're not going to find it in. We, we see that the devil would love nothing more than the opportunity for you and I to just skip over this message and to skip over this verse and, and, and just not understand it. If we're not careful, we'll read the verse and we'll see it but, and we'll claim it over our lives. But our lives will be an expression of a different reality. We'll say, I am washed by the blood. We'll say that I am free through the blood. But yours and mine, life will have an expression of a separate reality. That I am not in fact live, but rather I am cold. I am indifferent and I am dead. You may can try to say that you are one thing, but I am an advocate believer that your actions will speak louder than your words. That you can say one thing, but if your actions deem death, you are dead. If you are cold, you are dead. If there is no pulse in your spiritual man, you are in fact no longer alive in God. And your blood has grown cold. Hallelujah. Many people, as the pastor preached this morning, that they have tried to find life in other resources. They have tried to find their life in material value things. They try to find their life in a car. They try to find their life in wealth. They try to find their life in a job opportunity. I want to let you know that you will not find it in that job that you want so badly. You will not find it in the house that you're saving money for. You will not find the satisfaction of the inward longing of your soul in the material things it is only by the blood that you and I can experience life and life everlasting it's only in the blood I know that I spent a couple of years myself chasing after those material things I spent time in, in my life as a young man chasing after that occupation but I began to do a reality check on myself one day and I began to look back at everything I knew the word of God said and I told myself even if I get the job I'll still be dead and even if I get the money I'll still be dead even if I get everything that I want in the material life I will in fact be cold and indifferent lacking my joy lacking the love of of God I want you to know today we need a reality check that says life is in the blood and nothing else you can try to find it in something
something else. You can try your very best at getting that job, but it will not fulfill you. Only the blood can induce life into your soul. It's time that you and I have a reality check and see what reality that you and I are living in. We need to evaluate our souls and, and say, am I living in the joy or am I dead? Am I living in peace or am I bound? Am I living in the freedom that is in the blood or am I tied up to an old nature that won't let me go? What is the reality of your soul today? What is the sober reality that if you die tonight, where would you be? If you walked out of this house today, what kind of life would you live? What kind of things would you do? Would you still be bound up by the alcohol? Would you still be bound up by the pornography? Would you still be bound up by those lustful things that you never thought you'd get rid of? Or are you going to be bound up by the lies of the devil? Or do you live? There's one or the other. The blood will not leave you half and half, but the blood does a total work, a forgiving work, a cleansing work. So to not be in the blood is to be dead. Without the blood, there was no atonement. Some of you tonight, you may be confusing a, a moment of being numb for being alive. You may be confusing the numbness that you are sitting in, induced by the stimulants of your flesh, induced by the things of the world. You may, you may feel that you're okay, but I want you to ask yourself, if you didn't have that thing that you ran back to when you go back home, if you didn't have that job, if you didn't have that thing that you run to every time you get weary in your soul, where would you find yourself being? Would you find yourself being content in no matter what circumstance, or would you be bound up by the things of the world what's the testimony of your life what is what is the reality of your soul today is it life or is it death I, I pray that tonight that God will give you and I a moment of sobriety a moment of realization that when I walk out of these four walls will I have missed out on my chance to live or will I remain dead and cold and indifferent because my soul is bound up by chains I ask you today not to leave the same way you came because the blood still works. I can testify the blood still works. It still cleanses. It still makes whole. It still restores. It still renews. And it can do for you what it done for me. Oh, hallelujah. I'm encouraged to know of what God done for dead people like I once was. God looked down over 2,000 years ago and he saw a world full of dead, cold, sick, miserable people and he only saw one remedy. He only saw one remedy and that was to bring back the life that was only found in a garden of Eden. He wanted to bring back the life and the fellowship of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of man like we only saw in the garden. So what did he do? He said the only way to bring this back is through the blood of a spotless lamb. God looked down and he saw the reality of living without the blood. And he saw the reality of death and despair in the lives of so many Jews, Gentiles, heathen and undone people. He saw the expression that reality was further gone than man ever thought it would be. And so I ask you tonight to do a reality check and ask yourself, where am I? If God done a reality check on humanity, we too must do a, re a reality check and ask ourselves where am I am I saved am I lost am I bound am I undone or am I free by the blood because there's life in the blood we see in our text we see the life was in the atoning blood of a pure sacrifice so what God done in the, the Old Testament in the Levitical law he did it as a foreshadowing of it in the new Te in the Old Testament but we see that God seeing that there was a better way to do it, seeing that he wanted to revise the victory that he wanted to give to humanity. He wanted to revise the, the, the experience and the, the ceremony in which we would receive life through the blood. So God made a way when there was no way. God saw the expression and the reality of death and despair, and he made a way. Preacher, what way is that? Preacher, what do you mean he made a new way? He made a fresh revelation. We see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. I'm talking about a new experience that says a thief has not come to kill, but to steal and to destroy. And I, Christ, have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So I want to encourage you with the fact that Christ has come, that through his blood, 
blood we can be made whole. That through his blood you can be saved. That through his blood your body can be healed. Your soul can be redeemed. Your mind can be set free of the battle and the torment of the enemy. It is life in the blood tonight. You can look at it in the drugstore. You can look for it at the alcohol aisle. You can look for it on your phone. But you won't find it until you find an altar. And see that it's only there that the blood is applied. I remember the altar, and after tonight, I pray you'd remember that altar. If you musicians could come, oh, hallelujah. The, 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 new, the new life in Christ tells me that there is freedom. The life that I want to live is in the blood. The life of your marriage, the life of that lost family member, the life of your joy that you lost, the, the life of your finances, the, the life of your future, the life of your kids, the life of your entire family is in the blood, only in the blood. I, I have poured out my heart tonight to cry out to somebody that you can look anywhere, but you won't find it until you find the blood shed on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. It was shed for me. It was shed for you so that tonight you can know what it is to live. I ask you tonight, are you tired? Or are you tired of living the same old life? If we could stand this, you know, are you tired of, of seeing that the reality that you live is not life? Are you tired of having to numb yourself to reality because it seems too bad to handle? Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you worn out because you seem as though you fought your entire life to know what it is to live and you found yourself still miserable, still cold, still indifferent, still dead? The life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of your joy you're seeking for is in the blood. The life that you long for when you go to sleep at night, it's in the blood. I, I can't sit here and tell you of any other remedy but the blood. So I challenge somebody tonight, ask yourself, am I alive? Where do I stand? Do I have what they've got on that platform? Do I have the expression of life that says I can jump, shout, and run because my chains are on the floor? Do I have a reason to shout? If you don't know the blood, you don't know why we shout. You don't know why I cry at an altar. Because you didn't see who I was before I found Christ. I pray that after this service, there's people look at your life and say, who is this guy? And the only thing you can say, that was me before the blood. Because I found life in the blood. I found my healing. If you are sick, I still believe that the blood heals because I have my own testimonies. The blood heals. Sir, ma'am, you're the life that you want is in that blood. I, I wish I could make it more simple, but I think it's as, as simple as we need it. That what you're needing tonight is not in that thing you've been chasing for. It's not in ministry. It, it's not just anywhere. It, it, it's not at your job site. It's in the blood. Without the blood, I could stand here and preach and still be dead. But because of Christ, because of an old rugged cross, because of a blood shed crimson red, I can stand here and say it has life-giving virtue. It's because of the blood. Sir, ma'am, what's your reality? Say, preacher, that's me. Preacher, that is me tonight. I, I want what you're saying there it is in the blood, but I can't seem to find it. It's when you recognize there is no other way. It's when you recognize what I've been chasing after is in a 180 position to what I actually need. That thing you've been chasing after to give you life has pulled you away from your family. It's pulled you away from your church friends. It's pulled you away from what you know is right. And you still think you'll find something in it. At the end of every other road but Christ is death. Some of you have found it in your soul. But tonight I, I show you a life, a way, a truth that is in Christ. Christ that loved you so much that he shed that blood. He shed that blood knowing somebody was going to be here on a resurrection Sunday service. He shed it knowing that there was going to be somebody that needed healing. He 
he shed it knowing that there was somebody that needed more. So I encourage you, if that's you, can we come and find an altar? If that's you today and you say, I want that life, I, I want to let you know it is at the altar for you. That life that we see Christ has come to give humanity, it's not out in the world, but it is at this altar. The freedom, the peace, the joy, the love, the, the, the everything that you're looking for, it is in the blood. Atoned for at an altar. God, we plead the blood. God, if it was Your blood is a rescue to the sin state.
praise the Lord. Give him a hand clap of praise. I never get tired of hearing messages preached on the blood. I can listen to it every day. Amen. Thank God for the precious blood. If it had not been for the atonement, we'd all be lost forever. But the innocent went to the cross and died in my place, the guilty, so that I could live forever. I'll never fully understand this great love story, but I believe it. Amen. I don't have to understand it. Just believe it. God is good. HTSM, you did marvelous tonight. Every song, testimonies, the word that's been brought forth. Amen. In closing this service tonight, I just want us to join together and pray for traveling mercies for these guys as they travel probably across seven or eight states or more and ask God to be with them and anoint them. Can you join with me, Lord? We thank you for what you've done tonight through these vessels, these testimonies of Christ. I pray, Lord, for traveling mercies. Let the angels of God encamp around thee and let no harm come nigh their dwelling. Lord, I pray for a special anointing in every service. Lord, as they minister outside the church, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon their lives. Lord, draw nearer to the blessed cross of Calvary. Lord, I pray you'd give them, you'd give them results, fruit. Let them see lost souls saved. Let them see healings take place in the physical body. Let them see believers get filled with the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I thank you for what you've done in their lives, what you're going to continue to do. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we leave this house tonight. Thank you for what's been preached, the testimonies, the songs. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory for you are worthy. We love you, Jesus. In your precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. Church time Wednesday night. Come expecting God to move in this house. Thank you for your faithfulness on this resurrection Sunday night. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed.